Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This morning we celebrate Armed Forces Day. So when you hear your service song, we're going to ask you to stand and receive the recognition that you deserve. Let's stand and let's worship him. Peace. 
who gave their lives fighting for our independence, whose blood was spilled in foreign lands, kids who had their whole lives in front of them.
And how do you pay tribute to the soldiers who defend us today? Maybe we start by just saying thanks. Today we celebrate and honor those brave men and women for their service to this great country that we call America. Thank you. Let's stand and continue to worship.
you this morning for our singing. Lord, we stand before you and confess that you are the creator, the sustainer of the universe, and yet you care for us. You desire to have a relationship with us. Lord, we can't even comprehend your perfect holiness, 
Lord, but we know that uh, we want to be cleansed and sanctified before you this morning. And you already done that through the blood shed on the cross. Forever cleanse and redeem us. Lord, we are reminded that uh, we are to bring and examine our attitude and our readiness to meet you, Lord. We bring our repentance, our confession, our devotion before you. We ask for your forgiveness for our blindness to sins against one another, against sometimes even our loved ones, but most of all, Lord, sins against you. But we thank you for your patience, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to the repentance and turn towards you. But we thank you for your faithfulness and goodness. We bring now our obedience by means of our sacrificial gift, tithes, and offering to you. But we ask also that you anoint the words we are about to receive, that it may correct and edify us for your kingdom now and forever. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. every Sunday morning. At the end of the service, we have something called the altar call. We offer an invitation for folks to come and to pray and to lay their burdens down. And the song that Elizabeth is going to sing talks about that, that special time, but also that time right where you're seated right now, where you can make an altar in your heart and um, take your burdens to the Lord. I've already met folks this morning that are carrying some pretty heavy burdens. I would encourage you, just close your eyes to listen, to talk to the Lord, to meditate, and to take your concerns to Him, to His altar. Make an altar of sacrifice, of praise, of thanksgiving, of worship, of request, while she sings. I will lay it down, 
peace Come on and lay it down Lay it down at the altar Come on and lay it down Lay it down at the altar Lord, we do lay our needs and our burdens your feet today. Lord, I pray that you would bless us today as we focus on your word, that we could be encouraged and strengthened and uplifted by what you have to say to us. Lord, thank you that no matter what we're going through, you're always there for us. And no matter what happens, we can always depend on you. We can always trust you. We can always take our hurts and our burdens and our, our lives to you. So Lord, I pray that you would bless us, encourage us, and strengthen us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, today we are finishing the series. Find it here. And I hope and pray that over the last few weeks, um, six weeks, that you have found something. Maybe you found eternal life during this process. And that is an awesome, that is the most wonderful thing in the world that you could ever find. Maybe, you know, we did find God's plan for your family, for adversity, finding God's plan for the church. Today, we're finishing up with finding God's plan for the world. And I've, <laughs> that's a pretty big subject, isn't it? So I can't finish it all this morning. I'm going to do as much as I can this morning, and then tonight, we're going to finish this. And we'll actually have time for discussion tonight and, and dig into this a little bit more. But God, finding God's plan literally for our planet you know, God's Word tells us the planet that we live on will not last forever, but your soul will. And with that in mind, and I want to show you how Scripture, what Scripture has to say about that, I want you to know some of what I might say today could possibly make you a little uncomfortable. I hope it does. Um, might even irritate you a little bit. Hold on to your reservations and come back tonight and let's talk about it. Or if you want to meet privately, we can do that too, if it's really, really ugly. But um, honestly, I'd be happy to talk with you more about this subject. I do think that some of the scripture that we're going to look at today is a little bit offensive to the, to the modern American mindset. God created the universe for his own glory. Never forget that. He created us for his glory and for praise. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, because God knew what he was doing, he created us with a free will. We could choose to follow him or forsake him. We could choose to praise him or to turn our back on him. And because of the plunge that mankind took into sin, this planet, everything you see around you, was cursed. We are dying. This planet is dying. The world we live in today is very different than the world that Adam and Eve inherited 7,000 years ago. And our planet is extremely beautiful. There's no doubt about that. But what we see is a, a, a planet that has been marred by the effects of sin, earthquakes, tornadoes, natural disasters, man-made disasters like we see in the Gulf of Mexico. What, what, a, what a tragedy that is. And, and then global warming, global cooling. Which is it? I don't know. Depends on which channel you watch, I guess. But there are all kinds of problems going on in our, uh, in our world, on our world, that involves our world. And God's Word shows us plainly that He has a plan for our planet. And I'm going to show it to you this morning. Especially, especially for those of us that occupy the planet, the ones He created in His image. That's you, by the way, if you didn't know. That's you. God made you special. And I sincerely believe that we are living in what the Bible calls the last days, or the end times, or the last of the last days. And with that in mind, we need to be prepared for what's ahead. And we need to take time to prepare other people. If we really love folks, our friends, our neighbors, those that, and, and, and just, I believe that what this book has to say is true, is exactly what's going to happen. I want to show you that today. So follow along with me, and, and in your mind, just think back to the creation account back in Genesis. When a living God formed everything you see, just, with, just talked it, boom, into existence. And he created these, these people. But before, he created Adam first, 
and, and, and after the sixth day, he said, it is, you remember we said, it is good. What he did was good for a while. Then Adam and Eve got together and messed it up, didn't they? They sinned. They brought sin and the curse onto our planet. God cursed the ground. Everything was cursed. Everything began to die. And um, some would have us to believe that our planet is in a current state of crisis. It's a great way to get a vote, right? We're in crisis. Ah, you know, the last hundred years, man, has completely devastated the, uh, the ecosystem. Well, maybe they have. Um, I'm all for cleaner streams and cleaner air and all that. But the, here's the point, folks. Our world has been in a state of crisis for 7,000 years, especially if you consider the flood that happened a thousand or so years later. We've really been in a state of crisis. Our planet isn't getting any better. And um, the Old Testament repeatedly uses this phrase, um, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, when God will brutally and completely strike down the unrighteous, all who oppose him. And, and this is a future event, the day of the Lord. It's in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The prophet Joel talks about the earth being shaken on the day of the Lord when God pours out his wrath on godless humanity. And I believe the day of the Lord will be catastrophic on the planet itself. And uh, I also believe it's yet to come. It's future tense from today. The New Testament gives us plenty of information about what's going to happen. And, and what we're going to read, go, go and turn to Matthew chapter 24. If we got any kind of a proper understanding of this thing, it would be far worse than, than this, um, this movie 2012 could ever have come up with. That would have been a walk in the park compared to what we're going to see on this planet if the Word of God is true. If the Word of God is true, we have some things to think about. And in Matthew 24, Jesus is approaching his death. He's going to die on a cross. He knows he's going to do that. They didn't. He's going to rise from the grave. They didn't realize that either. And he talks about the fact that he's coming back, uh, not talking about his ascension or his resurrection and then his ascension, talking about coming back at the end. And he promises his followers that he'd return. Look at verse 21. Are you there in Matthew chapter 24? For there will be great tribulation, such as the, the such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor, nor shall ever be. Now, Jesus is God speaking. He knew perfectly well what happened at the flood. Now, remember, at the end of the flood, there was a rainbow and a promise. No more catastrophic worldwide flood. And if anybody believes in a local flood, that means God is a liar because we all know there's floods that happen all the time all over our planet in individual care areas. The world, the entire world was flooded. And God said, I won't destroy the world with a flood again. He promised he would not do that with a flood. But we read on over, look at verse 36. But know of that day, are you there in Matthew 24, verse 36? But, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, there's a lot of things going on here. He's talking about a second coming. Um, there's a lot of events that are involved in a second coming. People argue about that all day long. I don't want to argue about that this morning. But I want you to see that that day, that hour, the day of the Lord, the coming of Christ, even the angels of heaven at that time, and Jesus didn't at that time, only the Father knew. But as of the days, as in the days of Noah, were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as, as in those days they were, uh, before the flood, they were eating and drinking and making merry and giving in marriage until the day of Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. They didn't listen to Noah. They thought everything was great. No way could this great catastrophic uh, thing happen. And, and, and several months ago I preached a sermon called God's um, Track Record. God's awesome track, God's terrible track record. And, and on God's track record, if you look back at the history of God, what he's done, he already destroyed the planet once with a flood. Why would we be so naive to think that he couldn't or wouldn't do it again in a different way? He promised he wouldn't do it with a flood. Therefore, in verse 44, therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Okay, so what is that saying? What's happening? Um, 2 Timothy 3, I'll just read this to you, verse 1. Know this, that in the last days, perilous times, stressful times will come. In the passage we just read, it talked about great tribulation there in, in Matthew 24, verse 21. There will be a tremendous time of tribulation. Uh, Bible scholars talk about the great tribulation. Turn over to 2 Thessalonians. This is very important to see this passage. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
Paul predicts the coming of the Lord and the, and the Antichrist. Now tonight when we get back together, we'll talk about the man of sin from Daniel 9. And we'll talk about it in some more detail that I don't have time to do this morning. But Paul predicts that the, the Lord would return and this Antichrist would come. And there would be a tremendous time of judgment on the lost that would happen. This is God's plan for our world. So if you're interested in knowing the future, you don't have to go to a fortune teller. You don't have to go to Mrs. What's-Her-Name on TV. It's right here in front of you in the Word of God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Are you there? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, brethren, concerning this very first verse. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in your mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. He hadn't come then, he has not come yet, but he promised he would. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now we often call that man the Antichrist. And Daniel predicted a man like this, that Antiochus Epiphanes uh, somewhat resembled, um, but we know in the future, in the future of the world, even future now, future to us, this man of sin will be revealed, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing man, showing himself that he is God. Now, folks, there is no temple for him to sit in right now. So again, we know this is future tense. Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? And you know that it is that, that what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery, mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Now, when we talk about God's plan for the church, I told you my honest opinion, my belief on what that's talking about. I believe that's talking about the church and the Holy Spirit residing in the church being removed before the, the Son of Man is revealed and then we'll find out is destroyed. And the lawless one will be revealed in verse 8, whom the Lord will at some point consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. We're going to read the verse where that's done in just a minute. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. See that? Hey, I'm worried about the condition of our planet and our ecosystem, but I'm a whole lot more worried about the people who, the six billion people who live on it. And what it says here is those people will perish. Why? Because those who perish did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Ladies and gentlemen, that is why our church exists. That's why we're here. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. I don't know exactly how it's all going to happen, but I believe that he is. And our job is to connect people with Christ until he does. Understanding that this is their future. And for this reason, in verse 11, God will send them strong delusion that they should not believe the lie. I believe that folks sitting on the sound of my voice and under the sound of Bible preaching pastors all over the planet who have been given an opportunity to receive Christ, when this happens, many of them who have rejected it and rejected it and rejected it, will be deluded, they will be deceived, and they will send, and, and God will send a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, the lie of the Antichrist. That they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in righteousness. Okay, so how's that all going to look? How's it all going to go? We'll turn over to Revelation. And, and let's look at some verses in Revelation. In Revelation 7, we see the seal judgment. In Revelation 8, we see the trumpet judgment. In, Re in Revelation uh, 16, we see the bowl judgments. These are real horrific, catastrophic events that are going to, that, that will, where God will curse humanity during the later stages of the tribulation period with various horrible plagues and disasters. Now go to chapter 19 of Revelation. You can read all those on your own if you'd like. But it all hits a, a, a horrendous crescendo in Revelation chapter 19. I believe this is the Battle of Armageddon. In Revelation 16, 16, uh, the, 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 um, the, John describes the Battle of Armageddon, which happens in the Valley of Megiddo. Napoleon, when he stood there at the, at the battle, at, the, at that valley, called this valley the greatest battlefield he'd ever seen hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And in, in the future, what we see in Revelation 19, verse 11, in that valley, look at verse 11, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Skip down to verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of the captains, the flesh of the mighty men, and of the horses, 
and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all the people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and the armies gathered together to make war with him who sat on the horse and his army. So Jesus Christ is coming back on a white horse. They're coming to, to battle with him. The beast, who is the Antichrist, was captured. And with him, the false prophet who worked signs in the presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, those who worship and those who worship his image. These two were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And look at this in verse 21. And the rest were killed with the sword and proceeded out of the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. The armies of the world will come to destroy God's people. Israel. Where is this battle happening? Megiddo. The battle of Armageddon. And Jesus Christ will return in wrath and destroy them completely. Then He'll establish His kingdom. In chapter 20, it talks about that. A thousand year kingdom. I take that literally. The prophets predicted this kingdom 3,000 years ago. It's amazing to see the prophecies fulfilled. But then later in verse 20, in chapter 20, we see that God, or John describes this white throne judgment. And I hate to be so gloom and doom on such a beautiful day. Beautiful music. Praise and worship is awesome. But it's okay, I think, on occasion to stop and, 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 and see the sad reality that is facing our friends, our neighbors, those who do not claim do not name the name of Christ. Chapter 20, verse 11. Then I saw, are you there? Chapter 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. Now we know that there's another judgment called the Bema judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, where Christians will be uh, judged, and their, and their works will be, will be judged there. But we know who this is talking about because it says the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in these books. Listen, if I was judged according to my works, I would be in big, big trouble. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, again, each according to their works. The Bible in the Old Testament refers to our good works as filthy rags. Filthy rags. When we do the best we can in, in comparison to our holy God, that's what it measures up to. Those of our friends and neighbors who believe they're good enough and they're going to be okay, that's what their good, their good works and your good works and my good works measure up to. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. There's none righteous. No, not one. If we're judged according to our works, we're in big, big trouble. If you're, if you're present at the white throne, that's a very, very, very sad day. Then death and Hades, in verse 14, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, keep your finger there. Because there's a lot happening, and I'm not giving a very good timeline of it, but what about planet Earth? Of course, when you think about your soul and your eternal destiny, you, you probably care a little bit less about what Earth is going to happen to Earth. But keep your finger in Revelation and flip back to 2 Peter 3 for just a second. 2 Peter chapter 3. These verses explain exactly what's going to happen to planet Earth in and around this period. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts. Why do I read that? Because I believe we're living in the last days. And, and there's not going to be a whole lot we can do about all this white throne stuff more than a thousand years from now. But ladies and gentlemen, we are living in the last days. There are scoffers that would love to take this message and pick it apart and show me how ignorant I am for believing these things. They believe that. That's their opinion. But the Word of God says that there are scoffers that will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as, as they were from the beginning of cre creation. Why are you worried about Christ coming back? Why are you worried about all this end of the world stuff? Verse 5, for this they willingly forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. There's New Testament confirmation on the flood. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget that this one thing, 
that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, is in a thousand, and as a thousand years is one day. In other words, God's sense of timing is not ours. He's not bound by time the way we are. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us. Listen to this, folks. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Man, you need to underline that one. I love that verse. I use that verse almost every week of my life. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth on which righteousness dwells. Verse 14, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without having spot. Blameless. You should circle verse 14 too. So when is this going to happen? Revelation 21. Is your finger still there in Revelation 21? It tells you exactly when and how it's going to happen. Are you there in Revelation? Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be, will, will, will be with them and be their God, and he will wipe away the tears from their eyes. Why are they crying in chapter 21? Because of what they just saw in chapter 20. Billions, millions, probably billions of people cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever, and they're weeping. But God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe away their tears. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. When he who sat on the throne said, then he, he sat on the throne and said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He said, I am, it is to be done. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And listen to this. I will give up the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Keep your finger there. Don't move from there yet. John promises a new heavens and a new earth. John, the revelator, the one who God gave this revelation to, promised a new heaven and a new earth prepared for those who drink of the fountain of the water of life freely. Ladies and gentlemen, the clear teaching of Scripture is that this old world we're living in is going to be destroyed. And the bodies we're living in will too. Amazingly, God has promised us a new heavens, a new earth, new glorified bodies, for anyone who will drink freely of the water of eternal life. R-E-M saying, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. What a bunch of dingbats. They shouldn't feel fine. They were right. It's the end of the world. It's coming. But you shouldn't feel real fine about it unless you have a relationship with Christ. Tonight we'll talk more about that. Today I want to make some application from this passage. The planet you currently live on will not last forever. Neither will the parent people who live on it but their souls will last forever. Therefore, very quickly, therefore, number one, if you have your notes, please take notes. This will help you. I want you to look these passages up and do some self-study on this. You'll have a lot of fun if you do. It'll be very, not necessarily a lot of fun, but it'll be very interesting if you're willing to do that. If you believe these things to be true, which I just read to you from the Word of God by way of introduction, number one, action number one you need to take, you need to drink. Drink. Probably not the advice you were expecting to hear at a Baptist church today. Drink. What do I mean by that? Trust Christ as your personal Savior. Drink in the Holy Spirit. Trust Christ in every area of your life. Do you remember those old Gatorade commercials? Is it in you? We did that commercial when I was working with the youth. Is it in you? Is He in you? Is the Holy Spirit of God in you? Look at Revelation 22. Revelation 22. Look down at verse 12. You stood, did you keep your finger there? I hope you did. Revelation 22, verse 12. And behold, I come quickly. This is Jesus speaking. And my reward is with me to give to every man according to his work. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outsides are dogs and sorcerers, sexually immoral, and murderers and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you of these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say what? Come. 
And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So this morning, I would ask you the question, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? Today, we have a choice. We can drink freely of the water of life. We can choose to accept it or to ignore the offer. God himself provided his son to suffer in our place for our sins. He did that for his own glory and for our good so that we could drink of the, of, of the water of eternal life. I cut the grass yesterday in the heat. Just the front of my yard was quite a little, quite a little endeavor, and I was thirsty. I was so thirsty. I imagine anybody that went outside in the heat yesterday, you're thirsty. God created us with a thirst for him. He's drawing you to himself. In your soul, you have a thirst for something better, a thirst for something greater, a thirst for healing, a thirst for change, new life, drink. This offer is not permanent. This offer is not permanent. There will come a day and a time when the offer is no longer extended. He says here, I am coming quickly. And by then, the offer is off. It's off the table. Therefore, you need to do what you're going to do immediately. Don't put it off. This world is heading for destruction, so get prepared, get ready, get right, get saved, whatever terminology you want to use. I, I remember that that old uh, Indiana Jones movie where Indiana went walked into the, 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 the cave-like thing, and the old man is standing there, and there's cups everywhere, thousands of cups. And evidently one of them was supposed to give you some sort of ability to live forever if you drank of it. I don't remember all the details, but the, the, the deal was there was a cup that if you drank it, you could live forever. And there's this old man, I guess he must have drank some of it because he's been sitting there for hundreds of years. And, and Indiana walks in, he's looking at all these thousands of cups. And the old man looks at him and says, do you remember? Choose wisely. I don't remember what would have happened if you drank the wrong trip cup, but I'm pretty sure it wouldn't have been real good for you. Plus, they were nasty. They'd been sitting there for thousands of years. Choose wisely. There were thousands of the wrong cup and only one of the right cup. Today, there are many religions and thousands of opinions on the subject of eternal life, but there's only one that is right. There are not, there are not many roads that lead to eternal life in God. There's only one. So choose wisely. Choose wisely. You choose Jesus, He promises to give you eternal life. A new heaven, a new earth, a new glorified body. It's awesome. It's not just stuff we feed people at funerals to make them feel better, ladies and gentlemen. It's real. It's real. I had a good friend lose, a, lose his father this week. And when I talked to him on the phone, I said, look, and he's a pastor. And I said, look, all these funerals we do and we share these passages, it's either real and we really mean it and it sustains us or it's just something we tell people to make them feel better to get through it. I believe it's completely real. Based on what we know to be true about our future and the future of this planet, we must drink by trusting Christ in every area. Trust Christ as Savior. Trust Christ in every area of your life. Number two, repent. Repent. Turn away from the sin in your life. Repent. I asked you to underline that verse earlier. 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance. Now, is it possible for God to be disappointed? Is it? Is I mean, think about it. Is it possible for God to allow a person's will to override his will? I mean, these are deep theological questions. Who? And we'll talk about them tonight. We can come back and, and, and take a stab at that. How many does God want to be saved? Who does God want to be saved? Well, according to this passage, it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Whose fault is it if you don't get saved? Whose fault is it if, if, they, if they don't get saved? Whose fault is it? Here's a question for you. Whose fault is it if billions of people never hear the gospel? If billions of people, let's say a billion and a half people, will have never heard the, the gospel, We're living on our planet today, they don't have a Bible, they don't, they don't know the word Jesus, they've never been given any type of plan of salvation. A billion and a half people. Whose fault is that? If it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we've been given a great commission. Whose fault is it? It's our fault. People need to repent. They didn't even know they need to repent. Nobody's ever told them that. You're lucky enough. You're blessed enough. You're, you're, thank God you're here and you're hearing this message. And people all over Richmond will hear it on the television and, and the radio. I hope and pray that somebody repents and that we will be motivated, that we will be just on fire with this message of repentance. That's why our teenagers are going to Miami on their mission trip to go tell people about Jesus. 
to help them physically, to earn the opportunity to tell them, hey, Jesus loves you, you need to repent. You need to repent. We're going to talk more about that tonight, too. Number three, let's move forward. Stand. Drink. Trust Christ in every area of your life. Repent. Turn away from the sin in your life. And that's good for the lost. That's good for Christians. You might be the oldest Christian in this room. You need to repent, too. Look at your life and, and see the areas of your life where there's worldliness and sin and the flesh has corrupted it. And repent. And have a freshness in your relationship with Christ that you haven't had in a long time. You need it. I need it. Repent. If you've never repented, if you've never yet turned away from your sin and turned to God, repent today. And then stand. Take a stand with your life. If you happen to be there in 2 Peter still, you may be. 2 Peter 3 verse 14 says, Be diligent to be found by Him in peace, without spot and blameless. We read that a minute ago. Stand and take a stand with your life. Earlier we read this verse, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions of which you were taught, whether by word or or our epistle. And it goes on to say that God will help you do it. And we just, therefore, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, therefore, all those verses we read about the end times, the deception that's going to fall on mankind, the antichrist, the de- destruction that's going to fall on humanity, and then we read exactly what it looked like in Revelation. Therefore, with that in mind, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions, the truths, not the traditions that don't matter, not the traditions that aren't biblical, not the traditions that are preferences, the traditions, the truths that are handed down, which you were taught, whether by word in the Old Testament, the, the Gospels, or by our epistle, the Apostle Paul's writings. And he, and he says, God will strengthen you as you take that stand. You know, Todd and Lisa Jones, most of you don't know who they are, but my wife and I met them, and some of us met them last year in Botswana. And we, and we went to Botswana, and we served there for a couple weeks, and we had a great time. We served as well as we could for two weeks. But I'm mindful today that they are in Botswana standing, and Darren and Shauna Davis and their kids, and Todd and Lisa Jones and their kids, and all those other missionaries are still there standing day after day after day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. They're still standing for the Lord. And I thank God for them. James Dobson, Dr. James Dobson, founder of Focus on the Family, He's still standing. I understand he retired, but I heard him on the radio. He's still doing that some. He's still standing for the family after all these years. Franklin Graham is still standing for Christianity and for children who are in need after all these years, regardless of being disinvited to a prayer meeting or whatever else. Muhammad Ali was on television with Joe Namath 40 years ago on the Joe Namath show. And and Joe Namath and one of his other idiot hosts started laughing and joking about immoral sexual things they shouldn't have been talking about. And they, ha, 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 that's so funny, and this, that, and the other. And Muhammad Ali sat down right in the middle of him. He was in, uh, uh, being, being interviewed, too, and he just put his head down. He put his hands, he folded his hands in his lap, and he didn't have a word to say. He didn't go along with the gag, folks. He didn't want anything to do with that. He didn't laugh, he didn't participate, and he didn't mind making things awkward. He was glad to stand up for his Muslim beliefs in his religious beliefs. The studio audience laughed at Muhammad Ali and Joe Namath made fun of him and mocked him because he was so naive and so innocent. But the heavyweight champion of the world was not bothered in the least to stand up for what he believed in. Phyllis Schlafly is a Roman Catholic woman who has stood for the morality for 60 years. She stood for biblical womanhood against the National Organization of Wackos and for the sanctity of, of, of life for the unborn for, for many, many years. And she founded the Eagle Forum. And um, she was listed as one of the 100 most influential women of the 20th century by the Ladies' Home Journal. But most of you have never even heard Phyllis Schlafly's name. Some of you have. Most of you have. She's hated by the left. And she sacrificed her entire career, her whole life, standing up for what she believes in. The media makes her and people like her out to be a joke. If you're going to stand up, you're going to take hits for it. And what we need to understand is that standing up for the truth will cost you something. You can't blend in and stand up for the truth at the same time. If you're deathly afraid of making waves or being considered a little bit radical or a little bit controversial or being labeled right wing or whatever, you're going to struggle with standing. The thing that cracks me up about that is so many people over here struggle so much with that The people over here, man, they're more than happy to broadcast their beliefs and to push them on all of us. If you believe that God's Word is true, and if you're willing to pay whatever price is necessary to stand for Jesus and to share the truth 
with a lost and dying world, then God can use your life in amazing ways whether you are in your 80s or in your teens or anywhere in between. God can use your life. What is stopping us from warning our friends and our family and our neighbors about what is coming? What is stopping us? They mocked Noah, and and Noah is referred to in this passage several times. They mocked him until the rain started falling. And then it was too late. They mocked his warnings, and many will do the same today. But what about those few, those chosen few, who will listen if we're willing to stand up and share the truth? You've heard the quote, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And my question for you this morning is, what are you willing to stand up for? Are you willing to stand? Are you standing? Forget about willingness. Let's just throw willingness out the window. Are you standing or not? And will you make a decision today? I will stand. The planet you live on will not last forever, and neither will the body you currently live in, but your soul will. And so will the eternal souls of each of the six billion people who populate our planet. Therefore, drink personally of the water of life right now. Repent and go out and stand for the truth. We are called to be salt and light in a dark and dying world. Knowing what is coming, how could we do anything less? Would you pray with me? You bow your heads and close your eyes. We started our service there. We, we, I started my part of the service today with a, with a song. Talking about using this old-fashioned altar. I'm, I'm embarrassed that, that, that I think many old, uh, not old, uh, 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 veteran-type Christians think that that's something for someone else to use. Maybe for someone to join the church or to make a decision to get saved or something. They'd probably throw a fit if we didn't have an altar call. But they haven't used the altar in decades. I don't say that as any type of um, uh, guilt trip or anything to try to get you to pray at the altar. But I do want you to know why we do the, the, the altar call every Sunday morning. Because we believe this is a special sacred time and a sacred place for you to do business with God. Maybe today you need to drink and be born again. Maybe today you need to repent and get right with God, knowing Jesus could return today to stand, to dedicate your life to making a strong stand at home, at work, at school, here at church, whatever club you're part of, in your neighborhood, in your community, everywhere you go. Will you stand or will you not stand? I'm not asking if you're willing to stand today. I'm asking you, will you take a stand? A Christ-like, gracious, humble stand, always speaking the truth in love. Not hateful, not troublemaking. A gracious, Christ-like stand. If today's your day to be born again, I would just I would just invite you to open up your heart and drink deep of the Holy Spirit. God wants to come into your life and they'll do it through the presence of the Holy Spirit. You have to say, yes, Lord, I want you in there. I don't want to continue controlling my own life and doing things my own way. I need forgiveness. I need you. I want you in my life. To repent means to turn away from your sin and to turn to Jesus. To trust Him only with your life. Turning away from your sin. If you'd like to invite Christ into your life right now, I want to give you an opportunity to do it. And I can tell you there are hundreds of people around you praying for you hoping that you will. If God has convicted others of you about an area where you just need to stand for Christ, take that stand. If you want to come and join our church today or ask to be baptized or um, if you need time just to pray, just you and Jesus, like some have already done, feel free to take advantage of this time. But if today is your day to be born again, I want to lead you through a prayer, something like this. You can just talk in your heart to God. He hears your heart. You don't have to speak it out loud. You need to tell him something like this from your heart. Oh God, I need you today. I want to drink of the water of eternal life before it's too late. I want to do it today, right now. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me. I believe that you took the penalty for my sins on yourself on that cross. I believe that only you can save me. Nothing else. No one else. 
Lord Jesus, please come into my heart right now. Be my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Make me your own. If you're praying, I want you to think through the words you're saying and, 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 and offer those words up to God as your prayer. God, I need you. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save me. Forgive me of my sins. I believe in you and I give my life to you. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, you may have prayed that prayer today. I encourage you to come forward and let the whole world know I belong to Jesus. I've been saved. You may have prayed that prayer in the past and you just want to come forward. I know it's probably a little bit scary to take that stand, but it's the first stand you take for the Lord that says, you know what? I belong to Him. I've been saved. You can request baptism today if you'd like. If you need someone to pray with you, I'll pray with you, or Pastor Derek, or one of our deacons or Sunday school teachers will pray with you. If you have a burden in your life and you just want to lay it down at the altar, do that. If you're a Christian and God is really working in your heart about repenting and initiate and standing for, for something, He's speaking to you specifically about something. I encourage you to make an altar where you are or here at the altar and just give it to Him. Lord God, I pray that You'd move during our time of invitation. I pray that You'd give people the boldness to stand for You out there, not just in here. Lord, I pray for the one or two or three or however many just pray to receive Christ. Lord, I pray that you give them the courage to come forward and shake my hand and say, yes, I've given my heart to Jesus today or in the last few weeks. And I'm not ashamed of Him. I'm proud of Him. We love You, Lord, and we believe that this world is not going to last, but our souls will. Lord, help us to be consumed with the souls of men, the eternal souls of men. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand? Let's sing, just as I am. And come as God leads you. Just as I am.
dismiss our service. Um, in a moment, Pastor Fernando is going to come and pray to dismiss our service today. He has a special video that uh, he wanted you to see, a very short two-minute little video, thanking Kingsland Baptist Church for the way we responded to the need of a dear, dear person in our uh, church plant who was burned out of his trailer. And uh, many of you responded. Thank you for the way you responded. And um, when it comes to connecting people with Christ, when it comes to making the necessary sacrifices to do that, I thank God for a whole lot of people who are willing to get their hands dirty to take the gospel to a community, to a nation. Um, very thankful that we well exceeded our goal for our North American mission offering this year, supporting our 5,000 plus North American missionaries. Thank you for giving to that generously. And uh, there are multiple ways we can we can reach people for Christ. Thank you for being engaged in those. And uh, our youth and outreach pastor is back today. And if you see in your bulletin, got a little picture of their babies. And Pastor Derek, welcome back. And praise God for Karis McKinley Barnett. We are praying for you and so thankful for how God is, is blessed there. Please make sure you look at your bulletin. Ladies, the Friendship Fiesta is Friday night. Get a ticket on your way out. It's going to be great. You'll want to be there for that. Our 105th anniversary is on June 6th. We'll be in here in the morning at 930 and 11. We'll be here for the whole for the whole thing on that. So um, be here for that. Have a big uh, cover this luncheon afterward. And uh, this time, I would like to uh, ask you to point your attention to our video screens. We're going to watch a little quick Thank you video from Pastor Fernando, and then Pastor Fernando is going to pray for us and dismiss our service. Oh, Dios eterno, tu misericordia, ni una sombra de duda tendrá. Dios y Padre, te damos gracias por tu amor, por tu bondad, por tu misericordia, porque tú eres bueno. Yo te doy gracias por esta iglesia, Señor, que con tanto amor ha dado. Yo te doy gracias por esta iglesia, Señor, que es sensible a las necesidades de la gente. Te doy gracias por el equipo pastoral, por los diáconos, por los líderes de cada actividad de esta iglesia. Y bendigo a esta iglesia. Gracias, Señor, porque con amor y cariño dieron de lo que tenía. Gracias porque es una iglesia generosa. Gracias porque ayudaron a esta familia que habían perdido todo. Por eso te pido, Padre, que bendigas a cada familia que componen esta hermosa y maravillosa iglesia. Que fortalezca, que animes, que ayudes a cada familia que es parte de esta hermosa iglesia. En el nombre de Jesús oramos. Amén. Amén. Thank you, you're dismissed.
Rejoice in the Lord always.